Did you get any reaction from people around you? Oh yeah, um, faculty that have already retired were emailing me, keep fighting. I can't believe this is going on. Wow. Some people that just didn't know it. Some people that do know what's going on, you know, they're just afraid because they also go through things um, on campus. Our leadership is not very good at all. Welcome first time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli where everyone deserves a seat at the table. What about f-ing Colin? Why does he not have a f-ing job? Because he's still being white balls. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest f-ing ally. And he hasn't said one f-ing thing. A lot of people that have come on this show, I don't know why, they've gotten some good f-ing jobs afterwards. Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass <laughs> karma right here. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I love oh, man. it. I love it. We hope you enjoy today's show, everyone. All right, We're so honored today to be joined by some historic guests, Hall of Famers, and the GOAT, Cheryl Miller, on this first episode of season four of the Sports Deli podcast, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. We are joined today by Judy Sweet, the first female president in the history of the NCAA, alongside Ann Myers Drysdale. 1999 Women's Basketball Hall of Fame inductee, four-time All-American at UCLA, who led the Bruins to a national championship in 1978. She was also an integral part of the 1976 Olympic team while playing professionally in the original W, the WBL, the Women's Basketball League. And in case you were wondering, she was born the same day as Diana Ross and had 10 brothers and sisters growing up. She was a broadcaster and is a fierce advocate of not only Alicia, but of Title IX. We are again joined by the GOAT, Cheryl Miller, 1995 Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame inductee, former Phoenix Mercury and Southern Cal head coach, former All-American at Southern Cal, former broadcaster, friend, and huge supporter of Alicia. We are also joined by Steve Henson, assistant sports editor at the Los Angeles Times, who wrote yesterday's article on January 16th, 2023 about Alicia Berber, head women's basketball coach at Riverside City College, with an accompanying article about Title IX that included commentary from Tara Vandeveer, head women's basketball coach and Hall of Famer at Stanford, along with Corey Close, head women's basketball coach at UCLA, and Billie Jean King, founder of the Women's Sports Foundation. We are also joined by Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter, president of the Legends of the Ball, who also played in the original W, the WBL, the Women's Basketball League. And we are also joined by attorney Daniel Colage, Alicia's attorney. Can't thank all of you enough for joining us here today. It's truly an honor to be sharing space with all of you. And I wish it was under different circumstances, but nonetheless, we need to continue to talk about this incredibly important issue, not only at Riverside City College, but the impacts of Title IX and what it means going forward for the next 50 years. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, Judy, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Steve, thanks for joining us. Sure. Good morning, Michael. Hello, hello, Judy. Nice to nice to see you for the first time. Nice to see you as well. Thank hey, you. Anne. A great article. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, Anne. Good morning, Judy. Good to see you. Likewise. Hope you're doing well. Good morning, Anne. Bye. Hi, Steve. Good morning. Uh, waiting on Alicia and Cheryl, former Trojan. Sorry, Anne. That's right. She's former. I'm always a Bruin. Uh-huh. Right. Good one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good morning, ladies. Morning, Miss Miller. Hello. Hello. The one and only GOAT GOAT. <laughs> What's up, my yeah, well, I wonder whose number that hey, is Cheryl. behind you. That's right. Uh, some basketball <laughs> hack. Well, some hack took his your number. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What are you talking about? <laughs> You're funny. Well, hey, Alicia coach. Right school. How are you? Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning. Good morning. What's up, boss lady? What's up? You sound good? You sound better? Do you sleep well? Not really. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's just say I'm locked in my office till 1130, so I can't wait till my coaches get here. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the looks this morning. Did you get any reaction from people around you? Oh yeah, um, 
faculty that have already retired were emailing me, keep fighting. I can't believe this is going on. Wow. Some people that just didn't know it. Some people that do know what's going on, you know, they're just afraid because they also go through things um, on campus. Our leadership is not very good at all. You know, I did my walking class this morning. So I was with the group and then I just, you could just tell everybody's looking at me differently. You know, they're just giving me the stares and that, you know, I'm just, like I said, I'm just in my office. I'm just, I will stay here till practice. Then I'll go out with my coaches. I'll coach and then I'll leave with them. I don't get to stay in my office very long and watch film and stuff. I got to do all of that at home now. So that's a bummer. Well, stay safe. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm trying. Yeah. I got a game tomorrow. It's a going to be a fun game. We lost our last two games. Wasn't good. We lost our point guard to COVID for uh -oh. last week. So that was, that hurt us big time. But we got her back this week. So we'll be back on track. There you go. Is it a home game? Yes. And it's um, coaches versus cancer game. So before I jumped on right now, that's so why I jumped on kind of late. I was ordering our uh, cancer shirts that the kids will warm up in and the other team. Are you getting the support you need when you have a home game? Um, yeah, actually, we we have a lot of support, you know, the kids' families. And um, yeah, we have a lot of local support. Uh, How about from the department? <laughs> no. <laughs> I just had to ask. Is the athletic director there? Oh, well, since um, since all the craziness has happened, he will come in, kind of show his face, and then hide up in the in the rafters. Um, Peyton Williams. Yeah. So he'll, he, I think he's just kind of keeping his distance uh, for the men's and the women's games because he's had um, the men's coach cuss him out in front of all the uh, fans of a tournament. You know, earlier when Judy asked you how you were doing and um uh, Cheryl asked uh, I think how you slept uh I could just feel you um having your emotions really come to the forefront I mean I felt it uh like uh you know I'm an emotional person anyways but I I you know I'm starting to tear up and we haven't even started yet <clears throat> usually it takes us about a half hour before we get to that point on these podcasts um but I think it's you know coming to a point where uh, Steve, you weren't here earlier uh, for the podcast, but, uh, you know, Judy really helped us make this push to go national and even international because sometimes when things are so deeply rooted, as you've learned, you have to take things to another level. And so we really appreciate uh, your commitment to this because it's 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 a place no one really knows about. You know, when you wrote the concurrent article uh, that well, also came out yesterday that involved um you know billy jean king and tara vanderveer and corey close and you know them being quoted you know people can relate to that a little bit differently than they can to a community college coach that you know quite frankly most people could care less about but this is such a a bigger issue uh, and that's why all of you are here and so <clears throat> i don't really know where to start other than to uh steve if you want to you know, share any thoughts about what you've learned because you're sort of new to this. We've been doing this for a while. Judy's been probably doing it the longest along with Annie and Cheryl, but, you know, Alicia's been living this horrible life for the last 20 years professionally. Yeah, I've and, watched your earlier podcasts and uh, really, really enjoyed them and and, and uh, all of you contributing. I mean, that was that was sort of the, the foundation of, and the, the starting point for for my reporting. And uh, yeah, what you're what you're saying is absolutely true. That the um, uh, broadening the story from Alicia's um, experience, which just on its own is, you know, as, as you you've all pointed out, you know, it's it's just been horrific and and ongoing, um, relentless, and um, and broadening it to to have the the national impl implications. You know, what's going on everywhere and at every level. And so uh, for Tara Vanderveer and uh, and Corey Close to talk about what they experienced early in their careers, um, how things at their sort of elite D1 levels have gotten better because there's more resources. And, and there's, the, the uh, you know, I think at the JC level, there's a little more of a fight for uh, for limited resources. And so you can get 
um, coaches acting in, in, you know, the men's coaches acting in sort of a petty manner that, that they wouldn't do at, at, at D1. Um, and there's more of a spotlight. There's not really a spotlight in the, in the, in the, at the JC level. I mean, you know, it's, the, the media doesn't, doesn't cover JC as well for the most part. And uh, it takes something like this uh, for, for a light to be, to, to sh sort of shine into that, into that corner of, of athletics. And it's an important corner because you look at the student athletes at the junior college level and um, they're passionate about their game, you know, speaking with, uh, with Alicia's um, uh, team, you know, some of the players, uh, they, they're every bit as committed and every bit as, as uh, serious about their craft and improving and, and advancing academically as anybody at any, at, at any level. And so, uh, you know, it, it deserved the attention, the story deserved the attention. And I was, uh, I, you know, I was happy to do it. And I, we've been getting a, a great response. There's been a lot of a, a large audience, you know, there's been a lot of people subscribing to the LA Times through that story, which is obviously great for us. And um, it's, it's so far it, from that standpoint, it's, it's really been a success. So we just hope for the best for Alicia going forward. I want to comment on one thing. I think you're absolutely right that things have improved at the elite level. Resources are much better, but not everyone in Division I is at the elite level. And some of the stories that I hear are from the coaches who are not getting the support and the resources at the Division I level. It's just not a priority. So I think it's important to clarify it's the elite level difference from everybody else. Yeah, that's well, a good point, Judy. And also, I, something I learned through the reporting, and you all pretty much know this, is that the the Office of Civil Rights, for the most part, is sort of toothless. So the Congress doesn't fund it properly. Um, they don't have the they don't have the resources. They don't have the money. Um, they don't have the staff. And uh, and then the way that that, that um, you know complaints are 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 processed, the school has an opportunity to voluntarily um, comply uh, before before anything else. And a lot of times that um, you know that just doesn't happen, and these cases just drag on and on and on with no you know real uh, real consequence. And you're aware that originally yeah. when Title IX became law the penalty for not complying was supposed to be loss of federal funding. And you're probably also aware that pe that penalty has never been applied. Yeah, correct. I, I put that, I had that in the story. I think, I think you brought that to my attention. Thank you. It's crazy. All talk and no action. And, you know, Steve, I want to say um, thank you so much for spotlighting um, Alicia's story. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying not to be critical I made sure I read the Bible today, so guys, I'm going to be a little more tempered, but I will say this, shame on the press enterprise in Riverside for sitting on their hands and doing nothing, absolutely nothing, and they should be embarrassed, and, they, I, and I will keep saying that until they get off their hands and do their jobs, because what they're doing is enabling all these people at RCC, there's no accountability whatsoever. So we just have to stay the course. And Alicia, my, like I said, my concern, biggest concern is your safety. My biggest concern, and I, I know this can't help but consume you, but you cannot allow them to wear you down. That's, that's why they're gonna drag this out is to wear you down and make you start self-guessing yourself, should I have done that? Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I asking for too much? No, you're not. No, you're not. You're asking for what is your God-given rights at that, at that school? Nothing more and nothing less. The thing is too, Alicia, you, you've been doing this for 20 years. I mean, the fact that you've hung in there and you know, that there is support. Obviously, you've got a great support system around you with you, your family, and that's huge. But you know now with Cheryl and, and Judy and, and Steve and you know so many others that do support you and are really kind of aware because of this article and what Mike has really produced too with the podcast, that more information, there's more support. There's going to be criticism, absolutely. 
But if you don't try what you've tried every year and you continue to do it and stay strong, but mm -hmm. you've got to continue, you're, you're the face. You're the face. And as Judy said, for over 50 years now, Title IX has not been in compliance with major Division I programs, let alone junior colleges or high schools. Right. And so the fact that this is, a you know, not as much information is out on the junior colleges, it, the, getting this kind of exposure is so important for Title IX. It's huge. I feel like huge responsibility to the coaches at the community college level, because they do, they text me and they share with me, I can't believe my athletic director is doing this or the men's coach is doing this. And I can't do anything about it, Alicia, because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. And I'm afraid too. I'm not invincible. And, um, but when I'm all in, I, I mean, I just have this mentality as a, as a former athlete, I'm in it. And I, I just, I'm not going to back up and I'm not going to back down. And um, sometimes I just got to find a healthy balance though. Ultimately, it's up to the leadership in the community colleges to take the right step forward. After our last podcast, I contacted, first of all, the chancellor who said she has nothing to do with it, the chancellor of the whole community, <laughs> system, that it's local <clears throat> government, that I needed to contact the board of trustees. So I did. In December, mid-December, I contacted the Board of Trustees. Never got a response from one of them. Yesterday, I recontacted them and attached the article and specifically said, this could have been avoided had you stepped up. Still no response. As long as they're going to remain silent and they're not going to take any positive action, this is going to be allowed to go on. And it's pitiful. It's not embarrassed, Cheryl. It's, it's pitiful. You're right. That's a great word. You're absolutely right. And they should be ashamed. In addition to being embarrassed, they should be ashamed. But well, like you know, the Judy, Judy, the one thing, um, and I was talking to Alicia about this um, a couple days ago, and um, I'm not over, overly religious, but I am. And the Bible talks about people having a seared conscience and a seared heart. And all the upper crusties at RCC, they're seared. They don't care. The only thing they care about are themselves. And with people like that, it's almost like you can't even shame them because they don't care. Emotionally, they're not there. There's no investment. Psychologically, they've already tapped out. They simply don't care. And the only way that you get their attention is hitting that wallet and exposing them for who they really are. Go ahead, Annie. Well, just the fact, as, as Alicia said, you know, she's afraid. As all these other coaches, where's the support from the, the female coaches? And even the male coaches, as far as, you know, what are they so afraid of? And, and the fact that they can't have some kind of support and understanding of what is going on, uh, whether they have daughters or wives or mothers, that they would have some kind of compassion about the situation and whether mm -hmm. it's at RCC or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And um, and the biggest thing, you're afraid for your job. It's a job. And like Judy has pointed out too, when men are caught in really compromising situations as coaches, they get rehired. Women do not get rehired. Right. And I know of several women that have had to fight um, their schools uh, because they were fired inappropriately and they had to fight, and yet they've never gotten rehired as a coach anywhere else. And basically, they were firing to have the school comply with the federal law, right. and they were fired. Yeah, I want to point out a couple of things, and I know uh, Steve has to leave in about 12 minutes. Uh, Daniel Kolaje, uh, attorney for Alicia Welcome, and Elizabeth Galloway McQuitter, president of Legends of the Ball, uh, is also here. Thank you both Thank for being you. here. Uh, there's a couple of things that, uh, you know, Alicia asked me, I don't know how to feel yesterday after reading the article. And uh, and this is not a knock against Steve, but a couple of things that we chronicled in previous podcasts probably had me hotter than anything else. And then when I read the men's basketball coach at Riverside City College double down and weaponize as an African-American, some of the things that he said, calling Alicia a liar, and basically saying that he doesn't believe her 
and you know to go on record and double down about somebody who's experienced what she has for the last 20 years and basically say that I don't believe that my my basketball players, me or my coaches would ever do anything like that shows you how in denial he is and shows you how deeply rooted this is. And, you know, one of the things that was left out uh, of the article was the uh, and we've talked about this before, the meeting with the VP. And I know Steve knows about it. You probably just didn't have room to put it in where the president had to come, the president's office had to come down because the yelling was so loud from Phil Matthews, the men's basketball coach who called Alicia several times a liar in that meeting. And so I want to talk about that again, because that was left out of the LA Times article. Well, he uh, also made it sound like he was, that Alicia was prejudiced against his Right, players. that's what I'm saying. He was weaponizing. What the hey, that was yeah. so... See, that's what I have a problem with. Wait, well, hold on, Cheryl, hold on a second. Right, right, right. Hold, on, hold on a second. And and so this is the point that I made to, to Alicia also was, and I've said this before, she's not some chump, some former softball player who just took over a basketball program because they needed help. She's a former division one player. She played at Riverside. She's a woman. She's a, she's a Hispanic woman. She's a minority on several levels and she understands nuance. And this is what I tried to explain to her. And for, for coach Matthews to double down and to weaponize the African-American piece was disgusting. It, it, it was deplorable that he even, you know, had the audacity to say those words. And so that was the part that I, I could not, you know, and that's why I said to Alicia, I don't know how, I can't tell you how to feel, but I'm livid about the fact that he's lying and calling you a liar. Uh, and so, but anyways, if you want to share that story again about the meeting with the VP, because I think that needs to be highlighted about how he called you a liar in that meeting, and called you a liar in the article. I mean, you talk about doubling down. He's tripling down. Well, you know, I, with, with with witnesses. Well, and that's what was scary to me when when he says I'm using code words, how I feel, how I'm afraid. If this man, Coach Matthews, gets up, yells at me in front of them, in front of everybody that's in the highest power of the district, or at the college. And he's not even just yelling at me. He's standing up, lunging across the table and being so aggressive. And they do nothing other than, okay, coach, uh, can you have a seat? Uh, let's go through this. And I remember in that meeting, I said, I spoke up and I said, well, can I speak? And the athletic director said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I'm like, wow, you just let this man just yell at me. And I'm like having to raise my hand like I'm a kid in school. Can I speak? And um, and I couldn't believe, well, I, I guess I should believe the anger that he had. And beyond that meeting, I've seen him just cuss people out. And his own players. And his own, his players. own players. And using, I mean, I know coaches cuss. I'm not innocent, but I'm talking about using the n-word and to his, to, his, to his own players to his own players and for him to do that in that meeting and for him to say that i'm lying about that or i'm using code words as violently well what do you call um, grown men in the college throwing basketballs against the doors like baseballs or the whole door shaking i mean what what do you call that they were gently throwing it against the door how else do you describe that and so nobody can tell me how I feel. Nobody can tell me how I feel. Daniel, how long have you been dealing with this and, and, uh, and really the relationship that you have with Alicia in the school? Sorry, Alicia. Arguably since, what, 2010, 11, something like that, you know, when we, uh, you know, and, and intermittently since then. But then, of course, <laughs> we resumed uh, this lawsuit uh, or we started a new lawsuit, I should say, uh, in it was filed in 2021, but the um, preliminary administrative law type things, filing with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, which is now the Office of Civil Rights, um, you know, all that started before then. Of course, there was various correspondence and such before then as well. You know, the fact is the, the college has not paid any real attention to this in any serious way. I mean, uh, they they would just assume Alicia leave the, the university and let them go about their business as usual. 
And that's what's really, uh, you know, it, every indication in sense is they just want to push her out, and make her make her life miserable until she just goes. And and you know that the the college just the the district in general is has been fully irresponsible in my view, despite repeated, even in the last six months or so, uh, and some of that's highlighted in the article. This last six months or so of, of just abject harassment and just. And and discrimination at the same time because it, uh, in interfering with her access to her um, facilities is discrimination. It's not just harassment. It's both of them because the way they go about it. It's not just that they walk in. They walk in and very intrusively they throw their you know papers down on top of her stuff that before she can pack up. They are yelling. They're you know slamming basketballs and it's not just the players that do this it's the assistant coaches it's the coaches it's the head coaches that's just the and that's just we're talking about the men's basketball team in that context but out of that there's the ad's responsibility there's the responsibility of the president and vice president all the way up the chain really they all know about it they've been cc'd on every single one of the emails that alicia has sent enumerating every single one of these transgressions and harassment and and begging for help, literally begging for help. And it doesn't come, it comes with platitudes. That's all they get, that's all she gets. And, and, she, and things of the nature of, well, you can't disclose personnel actions, but they haven't taken any actions, at least nothing that's been effective. So we're sitting here with a, a lawsuit, which we're about to amend and add substantial allegations uh, that have come based on the conduct that has been exhibited since the lawsuit was filed and was bad enough as of the time we filed. I mean, she's still high. Judy, I know you made this point earlier about how she's uh, unique because she continues to fight where most people would have given up at this point. But literally right now, as we speak, Alicia's in her office with the door closed, locked. She has paper up on the wall so nobody can see in. Like the emotional toll that these things uh, from an accumulation standpoint have taken. And just one of these things would, would send us over the edge. You know, she's literally locked in her office right now because she doesn't want to come out until one of her assistant coaches or the players are there when it's practice time. Like it, she's a prisoner at her at her own job. It's just ridiculous. Go ahead, Judy. Have you filed a formal grievance with the college through the um, HR office? They deterred me from doing that. They, you know, I can do it anyways, but even the Title IX coordinator she says there's nothing that they can even do because the lawyers um, don't want, they don't want them to act or move. And so I keep getting the same response. And, um, you know, even the grievances with the union, oh, you don't need to do that. You already have a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I think you should do it regardless of what they're telling you, because at some point they may come back and say, well, you never went through the universe or the college process of filing a grievance. Don't let them tell you that you shouldn't or couldn't do it. Do it. You have nothing to lose by doing it. We know they're probably not going to respond, but do it. Steve, I want to give you a, a word here before you have to leave. Um, yeah, I would uh, encourage Alicia, and I'll, I'll be in, stay in touch with her to um, to just just keep me apprised of of. Uh, you know how how this plays out, and uh, Daniel, just listening to you say that the lawsuit is going to be amended, I was just taking notes about that because that's something that I would uh, I was wondering about that because there has been so much that's gone on since the lawsuit was filed that 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 makes a lot of sense to amend it, uh, and just uh, um, you, you know how the how this is resolved if it if it ever is, I think that um, you're making the point about Alicia fighting through this and not quitting, it, it, it reminds me of something uh, Corey Close said, that most women who file or or men who file Title IX grievances, they end up sort of falling on their sword and uh, and they lose their jobs. And yeah, this, is, this hasn't happened to Alicia because she's fighting. She's just uh, so resilient. It's just amazing. That, that to me is a, an amazing aspect of this. It makes it unique that she's not complaining and then and and then leaving, she's she's rightly pointing out what's happened to her, 
and she's just continuing to to coach a team that's 15 and five and 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 has some great aspirations you know that's something that shouldn't be lost on this she's got a really good team you know you would think that with all this sort of quote unquote distractions some people would call it that it would that it would affect recruiting and it would affect um, team morale but that's not the case the the, the team has been phenomenal and that should I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of that that these young women um, are having a tremendous season and they have tremendous camaraderie. You see it on, on, you know, Twitter and, and when they, uh, you know, when they banded together in the, in the weight room and, and, um, and chanted together, uh, that, that to me is, uh, is an amazing aspect of this. I can just chime in quickly on right. that. But I think what is important to see, it's important to see that achievement, but and what you're not seeing, of course, is, the incredible um, resilience and endurance behind the scenes that Alicia is, is, is dealing with. I mean, she, uh, it, it's, it's, it looks great. Not, she she's almost looks unaffected, but it's as your, I think your article even notes that is, is behind the scenes, she's in a lot of pain. It's, this is extremely difficult for her personally and professionally, and it affects her deeply, but her commitment certainly overrides that to some extent her resilience and determination and that of her, of her students likewise, because they also are exposed to all this. And it's, uh, it is a testament, their achievement is a testament to their uh, uh, resilience and commitment to what they believe in, um, but it, it's painful. Daniel, I'm assuming that part of your lawsuit is retaliation. Of course. Many of the coaches, as Steve identified, just gave up but some of them did file lawsuits based on retaliation. And to the best of my knowledge, they won. So that's an important part of this. She's being retaliated for 20 years. Steve, just so you know, I'm gonna talk about the uh, uh, part about Phil Matthews saying that Title IX is about men also. Uh, so whether or not you wanna hang around for that part, that part had me hot. I, I can't even believe that even understanding the spirit of Title IX, that he would even make that kind of comment that Title IX is about men. Uh, it's just it, it just it just shows you that it's not even about blind spots at this point. It's just about an old school mentality, somebody who's been coaching for 50 years and has no business coaching. And then the other part that was left out of the article, again, I'm not knocking Steve, but just pointing, merely pointing it out, was the incident with the wheelchair and the improper touching of Alicia's leg uh, and so, Alicia, if you want to share that uh, story again, because that um, is also something that is beyond inappropriate. And the touching, the touching of my leg or the wheelchair. Well, both, because they're you know related. Um, the touching of my leg started with just a um, surgery, so I had a workers' comp situation where I tore my knee up while I was coaching, and um, so it started with Barry Meyer saying that I was faking a knee injury after I got out of surgery. Um, this is the original athletic director that had pornography found on his computer and it was uh, relieved of his duties. But still allowed to come back to campus. Right. And as a lifetime parking pass. It's crazy. Anyways, continue. So um, so the, the new athletic director, it's, it's kind of <laughs> like when new ones come in, um, they just kind of take off where the last one left off. And he came into my practice and he wanted to make sure that I was following the workers comp um, restrictions or doctor's restrictions. And he just reached down in front of my team and just rubbed my pant leg. Like if you're wearing, you know, your coaching sweats and just to feel if I was wearing the knee pad and then helped me lift my pant leg up, um, to show me that and, or to show that I was wearing that. And I was just really in disbelief. And I, I, I you know, after the fact, it's like, you see these People sometimes on movies say, you're sitting there watching a movie and you say, well, why didn't that lady just say something at that moment? But when it happens, you freeze. Just like when they referenced your nipples at a holiday party with regards to the brownies that were sitting on the table. Like for you people that are listening to this for the first time, you have absolutely no idea what Alicia has been through. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, she needs all of our support and, um, you know, Daniel's obviously taking care of the legalities and Steve's covering, you know, things from, uh, the media's, uh, perspective, but 
you know, uh, Carol Stiff was a big reason why this this happened, former uh, ESPN executive. And so we're going to continue to push this because people need to know what's really going on, not only here, but in other places where this continues to happen. And uh, even though we're in the 50th anniversary, 51st year of Title IX, we're nowhere near as where we need to be. Alicia, uh, yeah. can I ask you a question? Um, and I've been sharing with Annie my concerns about your safety. And we were wondering if there's any way somebody can provide a bodyguard or somebody. Not unless you and Annie pay for it. <laughs> you can barely get money for buses. Nobody, nobody. Um, the only thing that I have, if I feel comfortable walking out or walking in, just like anybody else has on any other college campus, is you call the campus police and then they escort you in or out. That's that's what I have access to. Um, like I said, I use different um, ways to maneuver around the gym. Like I'll wait for my coaches to get here and then I walk out with them or we we leave. So I I've learned to navigate to try to keep myself safe. And, um, you know, and that's that's kind of the thing that upset me about what Phil Matthews had said. I'm using code words like I fear for my safety. He went to RCC. Well, so did I. And men don't have to fear for their safety here. And um, well, meanwhile, you're being run off the road, too. I mean, there's just so many, so many things that um, it's and I, I try to keep myself together where I don't cry. And I just those kind of things are frustrating to hear code words. I mean, that just, that's going to forever just stick in my head of code words. What are you talking about? Code words. I'm not making words up. Everything that I've ever either shared with Steve or any other person that's, you know, wants to write a story or ask me, it's all documented stuff. It's not made up stuff or it's not, I learned, you know, um, the legality part of it. It's not about feelings. It's got to be about fact. And I've always just tried to, keep it that way you know this is what happened and I've never really talked about my feelings how does this make me feel um even though we preach to the, our players all the time you know how are you doing today how are you feeling today um, but how does this how does this not emotionally and mentally come into play too as far as the lawsuit well, I can speak to that of course it does I mean all of this pain that I mentioned earlier is part of suffering is what you know they call generically pain and suffering in the context of lawsuits um but it is real pain is real suffering and and that's what she's enduring i mean the fact that she has any notion of having to maneuver on campus uh, where it's supposed to be a safe place i mean fundamentally your workplace your home these are the places that you count on for safety and security and the district isn't providing that it's not just about campus police and that, or, or video cameras, which are some of the things that the that the, uh, the district has suggested uh, implementing to make her feel more safe. That those are band aids. It, what's not being done is fundamental re-education, personnel action, things of that nature to truly change an environment that is inherently cancerous and inherently defective in the manner it has been managed by upper management all the way down to the coaches. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to me to have uh, coaches who not only on men's, but on you know, football and in other places in, within the district that are uh, teaching their men that it's okay to behave like this, that they don't, you know, I know Alicia goes hard on her kids. Uh, I shouldn't say kids, these are young women that are, uh, she goes hard on them to make sure that they are behaving professionally and like adults and that they are respectful of each other and others. And fundamentally, that's what this is about. You don't have to like me, but respect. Me. You know, that's, this is about mutual respect. It, and, and that goes across any race lines, gender lines, or any other, you know, ethnicities, what not, what not. you know, these are, mutual respect of your fellow man this is a fellow woman and fellow person these are just simple basic constructs that seem to be lost upon the district and and those who are currently managing that it doesn't it, it's it, it's it boggles my mind frankly that i'm that i'm here you know because we went through this 10 years ago 
and nothing's changed clearly. And if anything, it's gotten worse where they can just openly uh, act the way they're acting and have been acting ever since this lawsuit's filed, let alone before. You know, um, um, Alicia, the more I hear you describe your, your daily routine and how you have to change it up and make sure you know your coaches are there before you you know walk on the court to practice. Um, you make sure you have your keys in hand when you go to your car. You make sure you don't hear any footsteps in the hallway. And I'm going to say this, and I don't care what they think, but mentally, emotionally, and psychologically, you're being raped. You sound like a rape victim, and that's what they're doing. And somebody needs to step up because on, on my word, one hair out of place, trust me on that, believe that, but that's what they're doing to you. And I don't care what they say, they can sit up there and feel Matthew, shame on you. And I didn't want to like get into this with him or, you know, and, and I'm not trying to grandstand, but when they when he says something about code words and everything else, try this code word for him. Idiot, liar. Try that on for size, Phil. Gutless wonder. It's about ignorance and it's about misogyny. It's about a lot of words, right. you know, that come into play in these situations. And, uh, you know, we talk about old school. There's no old school. There's no mm -hmm. excuse for behavior today. You know, there's, you either re-educate yourself you either ad adopt the fundamentals of, of mutual respect and, and frankly, just fall in the law, or, you, or you're out, you know, get out if you can't do it. What is your gut feeling about why he's doing to you what he's doing? Is he threatened by you? What's really behind it, in your opinion? I think what's behind it for all of these guys is I know where all the dead bodies are. And I think that... I think they're afraid of that. I think that they, you know, there's so many violations happening around here that they think I'm just going to expose everybody, but that's never been my intention to say, hey, I know what happened on January 5th. Why don't we turn him in? And why don't we turn him in? Because I think when it comes to coaches and an athletic director, an athletic director should be policing the coaches. I don't think coaches should be turning in other coaches unless there's something that you, that's harming a, human reaches yeah and i just i just think he i think he's getting nervous for all the cutting of the corners and all the uh playing in the gray area with the rules i think they get nervous about that and and really honestly when all of this started with the weight room issue it was the football team tom craft the head football coach is not exempt from this he is probably one of the most vile people that i had to deal with when i had to sit there in the office and listen to him when he was, I don't know why they made him during the first time, the interim athletic director for like a week, but he, they just messed with me. He brought me in his office and I followed the rules and I sat down. And the first thing that he said to me was like, oh, you're as cute as my little sixth grade Mexican girlfriend. And I was just like, what? And so I had to just pause again. Like I feel so silly saying this as a former athlete, like you're supposed to be tough. You're supposed to speak up supposed to say something I was like oh my gosh I can't believe he just said this so then I I leave the office and of course I called Dan like oh my gosh and um so he's not exempt from any of this and it's and it starts I mean that guy is an administrator they made him an administrator he's not even like the other coaches he can call his own shots he doesn't go to meetings he doesn't do anything and um and it started with the weight room stuff and then it got to the news channels and then the men's basketball coach was upset and he's like well you should have focused more on football it wasn't us and it was like well that's like me telling you know steve here hey steve here's my story but you better post this and not this and say this and don't say this well i don't have any control of but steve gets his story and he puts what he feels he wants to report on i don't have a say in what the news says and so he didn't like it and then it just kind of snowballed into him going into this crazy behavior of um from I I need I didn't get out on time during practice to the men you know blocking the doors at our protest game to us getting charged to get in the men's game and it wasn't even 
it wasn't even about, you know, Phil Matthews and men's basketball. It, it started with football and it started with Steve Siglock and it started with the administration that wasn't doing anything. So I don't know why he's doing this. He knows my family. He knows my kids. He's doing it. He's doing it, Alicia. It's because in his mind, you stopped playing ball with him. Yeah, I, I made him very comfortable and he got the prime time practice time. Well, I got tired of having my young ladies drive at eight o'clock at night because we had the late time every year for the last 10 or 12 years that he's been here. So all we did was adjust it and God forbid he had to bump his practice back an hour, but still everybody's out of the gym by four o'clock. I think that's pretty amazing that the kids are on the road at four o'clock. Um, he just didn't like it because he had to commute all the way out to LA where he lives. Well, I, I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, that's what we do as coaches. We sacrifice what's better for our student athletes. Well, so the sacrifice being on the road. The frustrating thing for me watching this and, and listening to this is that, um, and Judy said, you know, how, how does the, the president not be involved and make decisions of the chancellor that, you know, is they don't see what's going on. Um, with the athletic director not making decisions and, and overseeing what's going on with these coaches and uh, the head of the university saying, well, it's not my responsibility. I, I, I just am appalled at a school that allows this. And, and as Alicia said from the very beginning, it's lack of leadership. And, and fundamentally, Stephen Daniel, Daniel, are you familiar with what happened at Fresno State? Diane Miller. Mm -hmm. Of it, um, and Lindy Vivas. Lindy Vivas. Uh, there were three coaches and an administrator who were harassed beyond belief. They filed a lawsuit, and the university had to pay over $20 million to these individuals. Wow. I think that there are some lessons to be learned from that story, and hopefully they can be used to help Alicia. But again, they, they've not gotten rehired. Right. It also started, Alicia, when you were a young coach and you were asked to uh, accompany people out at a bar. And because you didn't play ball, uh, you were denied fundraising uh, monies for your program because of your unwillingness to play ball when it came to going out and hanging out with the boys. So there was that part of it too early on in your career. So make sure we note that part of it. Yeah, that it started because I didn't want to do what Barry wanted, Barry Meyer wanted me to do. And I wasn't going to go to bars pregnant with my daughter. Um, so I paid, needless to say, lots of money out of my own pocket, feeding my team or, you know, things that we need. And um, I think every coach, not just me, I think there's lots of coaches, just like there's lots of teachers you hear it all the time. They don't have supplies for their classrooms. So where does it come from? It comes from their own pocket because they're passionate and they love their student athletes. So they want to make sure that their students have a great experience. And I, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, but he denied you fundraising opportunities because yep. of retaliation. Yep. And they, they do, they retaliate. Oh, that, yeah. And then, and it started with, I mean, I lost my house. I couldn't afford my house anymore. So I, now I'm just, I mean, when you, when I moved into my house, I moved into a smaller home and I love my home. Don't get me wrong. I love my home. My kids love my home. But if RCC decided to fire me, well, guess what? I could go work at Del Taco and still put a roof over my kid's head. I know that's not really a way to live when you're looking for your dream home or whatever, but I also have to make sure that I, you know, I have a responsibility to my, my family unit. And as long as my kids are okay and losing my job, <laughs> It's not an option when you have a kid in college because um, college is pretty expensive. Um, so I just think if RCC thinks I'm going to quit after all these years. Um, mm -mm. They don't know you. They don't know you. They no. really don't know you. Steve, anything else? Uh, I know you've stayed a lot longer than you uh, were supposed to. I really appreciate it. Annie, same thing. Uh, anything else for the good of the cause? Um, I, I just had another Zoom at 1030 and I'm, yeah. I'm already late for that. So I'm, but this is fascinating. So I just decided to stay up. <laughs> well, we really appreciate it. Uh, there's Thanks, a lot of other things You're awesome. Yeah. Annie, anything else uh, for the good of the cause? 
Well, I just, you know, I'm with Cheryl. You, you just about um, Alicia, your safety and uh, how we protect you and your family and your family, because what is the retaliation with, with some of these people and in the community, as Cheryl has talked about, the local commu uh, newspaper not stepping up and uh, who knows what the rest of the community is because, you know, they're afraid, they don't understand. And uh, here's a woman that's right, fighting for the rights of others and not to have that support um, is kind of mind boggling because these men, um, whether you believe in affirmative action or, you know, just things that, uh, I, I don't even know what the salary situation is compared to what the, the men are making there at RCC compared to what Alicia should probably be making um, and isn't. And, uh, and that's a whole nother thing too, but that's part of Title IX. And uh, it just, I know, you know, I met Alicia a few years ago with Cheryl and it just, you know, we've formed a, a great friendship. I'm probably not as close and, I mean, because I live a little bit further away, but I know Cheryl and Alicia are very tight. They're like sisters and uh, as I am with Cheryl and I've become that way with Alicia. So I care so much about what is happening, not just for her personally, but just really what she's going through for other women that are going through the same thing that, are, mm -hmm. that don't have that voice. Yep. yep. Well said. Elizabeth, I know you're here, but you're in and out. Um, anything that you wanted to share? We wanted to give you the floor if you uh, have anything that you want to say. Appreciate you being here. Uh, appreciate all of you being here. Yeah, I apologize. I, I always jump on when I can, even though I have other irons in the fire. I just want to always show up uh, to support. So even when I can't engage, I want my, her to know that I'm here. Um, Alicia, I know that... Um, you have that support. I think sometimes it's it's good just to know that that people care, and I just want you to know that I care. And um, I've done behind the scenes as much as I can, and I I still have something that I'm working on with uh, Michael, and I haven't been able to get to it, Michael. But you know what I was talking about, and I will definitely follow up with that. And I think you can share it with the others. I just can't say definitively right now, but um, yeah, I will. I you updated on that uh, a very uh, influential person that i'm trying to reach out to yeah. thank you so much that. you're welcome all right anything else for the good of the cause uh, i did invite jamel hill i did invite uh, jay billis uh, they have responded they just are busy today eileen hauser from athletes unlimited uh, there are a number of people that were also invited to this and are well aware of the situation uh, but can't thank you guys enough uh, ladies uh, steve daniel uh, for joining us again here today. First episode of season four of the Sports Daily Podcast, chronicling Steve Henson's article in the Los Angeles Times on January 16th, 2023, uh, not only about uh, Alicia Berber, head women's basketball coach at Riverside City College, but about Title IX uh, alongside with Tara Vanderveer and Corey Close, as well as Billie Jean King uh, in those uh, accompanying articles. Uh, anything else for the good of the cause? Ladies, Daniel? Steve. Michael, thank you so much again for your continued support, keeping the pressure on. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something we need to keep highlighting, not only here with Alicia, but elsewhere in this country. And uh, it, it's a it's it's never ending struggle and fight. But uh, fortunately, we have people that are willing to uh, put it forth and and make that effort, uh, you know, in contrast to those who would obviously uh, oppose it and and say, what about me, you know, for equality, you know, as opposed to recognizing the inequality that they're perpetuating. It's, it's, it is shameful uh, and, and putting a spotlight that on that is the one major step in, in the right direction. Alicia, yeah. filed a grievance, stay safe and strong. And if I recall, when I contacted the chancellor of the system, one of the things that they reported was that they do get involved if there are any safety issues. And I'll try and pull that letter up, so. Okay, keep firing at them about that, Stay. Judy. Yeah, Stay because the Because I just, I, I'm, I'm telling you guys that I don't wanna be a, a doom, you know, doer or believer, but I do believe in safety. Yeah. And the fact that she's having to constantly change her routines up to make sure she gets home safely to her family and they're not seeing this and they're certainly not hearing it. They don't want to. Bingo. 
Yeah, Daniel, you know, I don't know why you just wouldn't do common sense kinds of things and you're and you're uh, out is always well, you know, there's legal things going on right now, so we don't want to touch it. I mean, it, 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 I, I just can't understand how it's that black and white when it comes to common sense types of things, you know, that you can take action now, even if that's going to play out later. Now, there's no logic to hiding behind uh, lawsuits or, or lawyers and then breaking the law. It, or, or using that as an excuse to break the law or, or to not right and, and not to implement immediate measures to correct what's going on it, that's it doesn't it's not logical it's it's right to say i'm not going to do it because the lawyers say so or <laughs> the lawyers don't want us to do anything because we have a lawsuit going on it doesn't make any sense whatsoever you know, daniel is because they've never they've never received or had to deal with consequences there's no consequences for them. So they feel impugned that they can continue this absurd behavior. They haven't faced consequences. And Daniel, I hope you sit up there and, and absolutely get every penny from that school and then some and a bag of potato chips. <laughs> oh, yes. She's going to get that. She's going to get that bag. But more importantly, the like he said, the reeducation and making sure people mm -hmm. are out of positions of leadership that have absolutely no business being in leadership. There you go, Michael. You hit it. I mean, ding, I know ding, ding. I, I know Alicia more than anything wants one day to be able to leave this program on to somebody else who doesn't have to deal with the problems right. that she's been facing. That's, you know, I was mentioned in the article and and fundamentally that's that change is what needs to be had, not only here, but across the country at all levels. And, uh, you know, obviously every place there's a fight and a battle to be won and there's a change to be made. And I hopefully that is, uh, this will be one of those places. Yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to get paid money to leave and then nothing changes. No, no way, no way. And sometimes money is the only thing that speaks and, and the only way a change gets effective, you know, by having money True paid. That. You know, that. That. but nevertheless, Absolutely. it's all it's all integral and these are all parts of the puzzle in a sense. And you know, I'm very proud of Alicia and all the fight that she's had, and I'm very grateful for all the support she's given. Absolutely. So what's the timeline for the amended uh, lawsuit and uh, going forward? Is there a way we can expedite any of this or you can? Not we, but you. Well, you know, there's certain steps we have to go through administratively uh, in order to amend the complaint um, and, uh, and through the litigation. So, I mean, there's a there's a loose timeline. The, the short answer is sooner than later. Yeah. But, uh, we're trying to put that together. I, ironically or not ironically, I don't know if the right word is, but they keep doing stuff it almost it seems like every other day something new happens. And, and so just as I'm, I'm almost, I think I'm done with preparing the amendment, <laughs> something else happens and say, well, I got to add that now, got to document that now, you know? And so it's, that's been part of it. I mean, honestly, throughout the last few months, there's been so much happening that I, I, I get these calls and I, I almost roll my eyes going, you got to be kidding me. I, and, you know, again, now, yeah. and, and, you don't even say hi anymore. What did they do now? It's it's really yeah I, exactly. That's pretty much you know I, without disclosing attorney-client communications, it's it's my response when I get called from Alicia. I was like, what happened now? You know, it's, so it's uh, it, it's astonishing. I, I I've never I, I really haven't actually experienced that before. You know, typically in a lawsuit, you once you file that lawsuit, people are on their best behavior. If anything, mm -hmm. been the opposite. Well, Daniel, you know what they call that in my neighborhood? Can't get right, won't get right. That's RCC. They're a bunch of can't get rights and won't get right. Absolutely. Well, we're going to force their hand. Fair enough. Anything else? I'm good. And I'm proud of myself. No curse. <laughs> yeah, that was, pretty, that was pretty good. <laughs> I've got my best behavior, y'all. <laughs> Steve, thanks again. We've had a lot of people from the media on here, uh, you know, from Bob Nightingale, a colleague of yours at USA Today and others. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't know the nuances uh, to your job or, you know, what you're supposed to or not supposed to do versus uh, what you're just going to do because it's the right thing to do, like we've been talking about today. But your time and effort is greatly appreciated. And, uh, yeah. you know, tying it into Tara and Corey and Billie Jean King, I think was uh, – a phenomenal thing to do 
And I uh, know we're all deeply appreciative for your work. Yeah. Steve, thank you're brilliant. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll talk soon. We'll continue this conversation. Uh, this will not be the end of it. And uh, Elizabeth, thank you. Alicia, we love you. Anything we can do to support you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Judy, thank you again. Cheryl, love yeah, you. Thanks. All right, everybody, yeah. thanks stay blessed. Efforts. Good day. Stay blessed. All right, you too. Bye. I appreciate you. Good seeing you. Yep. Absolutely. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast. It was incredibly powerful. We hope that you take action. Uh, reach out to the Los Angeles Times and demand justice at Riverside City College. If you know of any other stories with regards to Title IX violations, you can reach out to me at thesportsdeli at gmail.com, and I will get that information to the right people. The more support that we have, the better off we're going to be, not only in the short term, but in the long run. And again, can't thank you enough for joining us today. We hope we added value to your day. We hope we added some inspiration, motivation, and education. And until next time, much love, everybody. Peace. Boy, that was phenomenal. Great job and much love to everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I want to send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40 Tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand and they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co, because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible. And uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. And now you can call 988. That's it. All you got to do is dial 988 from any phone. And they are available 24-7, 365 days. A year. And if you want to follow me on social media or Check out other episodes of this amazing Sports Deli podcast or any of my other podcasts. Go to my link tree at linktree backslash Mike Hootner. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either 99 cents a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, you can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. There's a link at the bottom to support the show. Please check, check out our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody.